If you want to grow and flourish in your faith, if you want God to be all for you that he can be, there's some things you got to have. you got to know about the cross of Christ and what that's all about and the resurrection of Christ and how that gets you started spiritually. you got to have that. I'd love to share that with you. you got to know about the authority of God's word in your life. you got to have the cross. you got to know about the authority of God's word. Here's the third thing. you got to know about the greatness of God. You got to know how great God is. If you have a little teeny weeny on the mantelpiece God, he is not going to help you and make it through the things that life brings our way. Isn't that right? Well, let's take our Bibles and go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. While you're turning there, let me just give you some just very brief comments about the book of Isaiah. Obviously, the author is Isaiah. He's one of the greatest prophets in all of scripture. Now, the job of a prophet was to stand between the people and God. And God would give a word to the prophets about himself, about their situation. And then the prophet would bring that word to the people. And Isaiah is one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, His book and his life, just to kind of put it on the map a little bit, think of 700 B.C., About 2,700 years ago, that's Isaiah. And yet you're going to see that though he lived and wrote so long ago, that what he wrote about is so relevant to our lives and what we're facing today. Scholars divide the book of Isaiah into two sections. Chapter 40 begins the second section. And the reason why it's a different section is because what Isaiah is writing here, what he wrote, was not primarily for the people of his day. Though it can bring comfort to us and though it brought comfort to them, the primary audience were the people of the Babylonian captivity, which wouldn't happen for almost 150 years after Isaiah said these things. And yet we can pick up and sense immediately that God has a special word for us here this morning. Now, I know you're going to have a hard time believing this, so I'll just say it and you'll have to trust me. The message this morning has only one point. I kept studying this passage over and over and over and just kept seeing the same thing over and over and over. Here it is, one point. God is awesome. His comfort and strength are all we need. Now, you've not studied what I've studied, so why don't you go ahead and say that with me by faith now. Go ahead, say it. Amen. Amen. Now let's go into the text and let's see it for ourselves. Let me just look up here for one more second. Let me break it down for you and you'll know where we're going. All right. The first five or six, seven verses right there, eight verses talk about, I'm thinking of this whole thing as a mountain. All right. We're going to climb the mountain of the awesomeness of God. The first eight verses is preparation for the climb. All right. Then the next couple of verses after that deal with the heart of the person we're climbing to see. And then beginning around verse 12, starting at 9 and down through 12, we're going to actually get into the ascent of this great subject, the awesomeness of God. So let's start first with some verses of preparation. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 says this, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Now notice that God wants his children comforted. God's heart for every one of his children here today is that they would experience his comfort. Now maybe you grew up and heard a lot of teaching about the holiness of God and the wrath of God and the anger of God over sin. And all of those things are taught in scripture and they are important. However, alongside those truths comes the incredible compassion and love of God. And if you're here this morning and you're hurting... And you're here this morning and you're struggling. You're here this morning and you're carrying a burden or a trial. Understand this, please. God knows that. He is so aware of that situation. And beyond that, he wants you comforted. Here in Isaiah 41, he went right to Isaiah. And he said, Isaiah, there's something I want you to do. I want you to comfort my people. I want you to comfort them. And oh, that God would give me this morning the capacity to stand in that place and bring that same word of comfort to you. Notice the instruction in verse 2. Speak kindly to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is just euphemistic for where God's people are. And we are God's people. The phrase kindly there, some of your versions have speak tenderly. Like a young man wooing his bride. Words carefully chosen to bring the greatest impact and the greatest comfort. Now notice this. And call out to her that her warfare has ended. That word warfare means literally hard service, days of labor. 
And the children of Israel had been going through some great trials and God had been judging them for their rebellion. But he says those days of struggle have ended and there comes a season when we're not to struggle anymore and all of life is not to be hardship and heartache. There's supposed to come a day when those days are done and good days, days of encouragement and strength are to follow. Call out to her that her warfare has ended. This is great. That her iniquity has been removed. That she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, if, uh, if you've been reading the book of Isaiah in Isaiah's day, let me tell you, that verse would have stood out to you. Because that's really the first time that the book of Isaiah ever really makes clear that God is a forgiving, pardoning God. Now, just 13 chapters later is Isaiah 53 that makes it very clear that God's plan was that he himself would take our sins upon himself. But that verse right there, some of you, and I know this is true, it's true every week. It's true very often in my own life. Some of you are here this morning and you failed the Lord this week. And you've fallen into the sin, you've struggled in a certain area, you've said something you said you'd never say again, or you've done something. And I trust that you'll hear the word this morning of God's love and God's forgiveness. Her iniquity has been removed. She has received of the Lord double for all her sins. And now, beginning in verse 3, God makes it clear that he himself wants to bring the comfort to us. And so it says, a voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. This whole passage, of course, is prophetic of the ministry of John the Baptist. But the picture that's being created is of God coming to his people. And God wants all obstacles removed. God wants to come to your life this morning and bring comfort to you. And he wants every single obstacle taken out of the way. Look again at verse 3. Clear a way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up. And every mountain and hill made low. Get it out of the way. We're going to get to the person. Let God through. Let the rough ground become a plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Let nothing hinder the arrival of God to the lives of his people, bringing comfort and strength and encouragement. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Again, prophetic of the ministry and the life of Christ and ultimately fulfilled in the reign of Christ yet to come. That day when the glory of the Lord will be completely revealed. Now, I've been walking with the Lord for, I don't know how many years, 20 for sure. You know, there's only been little times in my life where I feel like I've got a little peek, just a little peek at the glory of God. There have been times when I've been alone with the Lord or with a small group of people praying and I feel like just the smallest portion of the little corner of the curtain has been lifted up and a little bit of the glory of God came through and we were on our faces before God. Now imagine how great it's going to be in the day when the glory of God is really revealed. And one of the things that I've been praying and hoping and asking is is that somehow through my sinful lips and our struggling hearts that somehow God in this series would bring his glory to bear upon our church and upon our families and upon our lives so that we would see God lifted up before us in a way that we've never seen him before. What a wonderful thing to pray that the glory of God would be revealed. Now notice verse 6, because if that's your heart's desire, the first thing you begin to say to yourself is, is, God, how could that possibly happen? How could your glory be revealed? Verse 6, a voice says, call out. Then he answered, and I felt this so many times, what shall I call out? What shall I say exactly to communicate, God, your greatness? Words fail. How could I possibly communicate omnipotent, transcendent, omniscient God to these people? You give me the words, I don't have them. And Isaiah felt the same way as he said, all flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. In other words, there is no human capacity to communicate the greatness of God. Grass and flowers, that's all we are for a little while and gone. And not one person here in our temporal lives has the capacity to communicate the greatness and the awesomeness of God. Where does that message come from? Look at verse 8. 
The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And my confidence in standing before you this morning and communicating the awesomeness of God has absolutely nothing to do with my capacity to put things into words. But instead, as you see, we all have our Bibles open in front of us. And the very message that I bring to you this morning is the message from God's word. It is God speaking about himself. It is God telling us how he wants to be known and understood as awesome. And surely his own spirit can take that word this morning and cause God's greatness to be lifted up before our eyes. Amen? Amen.